Producer. Yo, what's up, guys? Welcome to Producer, the podcast for producers. Today, we're joined by Alex Kislov. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. What's up, dude? Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to have you, man. What uh, what do you do for the people, like so <sighs> they can know? So when I'm not being Spider Man, um, no, oh, we can't release this now. <laughs> yeah, don't tell Peter. Um, but my uncle Ben always told me, with great power comes great responsibility. But what I actually do, so I am a producer. I work in music. I DJ. I've been DJing for. A really long time 20 years two-thirds of my life more i would say um and that's kind of always been my passion i've studied different things in college and worked in different jobs but it's always been music and somewhere or another i always find myself here for sure well we have you here to talk about literally anything and everything right. um but also to talk about your new album which came out dream sequence mm -hmm. and uh i wanted to ask you are you a daydreamer Ooh, <laughs> it's like kind of a corny question but you like, know it's like um yes in short the answer is yes i do daydream um but in the length of where the album goes it's more than just one sequence of what you are it's multiple sequences mm. so like you could be a daydreamer but you can also be somebody that has nightmares or somebody that has really good dreams lucid dreaming you know different types of uh i don't know what the word is but different types of dreamers i guess things that like aren't reality yeah but it is reality like you're not leaving to another place that doesn't exist past your own imagination you know like you yes you're not here in reality we're getting very heady with this stuff i love it we're already in <laughs> uh like the idea of dreaming is that yes you are escaping what is the surface of the reality but nothing new is created that isn't already there so it's not an unreality you know do we create consciousness or are we just a vessel for it to come in? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect you to have the answers, but yeah, I don't know either. Uh, I think you are what you are and what you want to be. I have this concept. I read this book called The, the Jazz of Physics. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts was that like basically like the soul goes through us. We're getting really heady. I mean, yeah, yeah, we are. Um, but that the soul goes through you, and it's not necessarily like that you have a soul. It's just that like your body is this like filter. Or you're the vessel that brings the soul. Yeah, it's almost like if you saw like a thing like going like energy going through you, like that's the soul, and you're kind of like a filter. Okay, but every filter is different, and that's what the what we perceive the soul is it's like the filter is the soul but it's not the soul so let me ask you this yeah, yeah, yeah does everyone have the same soul that's being vesseled in through us so i don't know i feel like it could be that there are certain energies that you're like tuned in and cycling through maybe your filter you know just like your water filter it like only has if you got a water filter <laughs> it only gets like the carbon out or like the whatever the heavy metals right um, maybe you got like one of those reverse osmosis filters and that's like the good shit. So let me get this straight. Nothing. <laughs> we're, we're, we're changing roles here. Um, yeah, yeah. The soul is the same essence, but the way it filters out through our vessels is what makes it come out perceived differently. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's yeah. like a, like the cigarette butt, you know? You yeah. We are cigarette. the cigarette butt. <laughs> are you a parliament? Definitely. Like with the recessed filter? I'm 100% like a, a parlor or a Marlboro Light. Okay. Yeah. Or are you like, um, God, my mom listens to this. She's be like, how much do you, how do you know about cigarettes? So <laughs> good. Um, but like also you could be a camel crush. So like some days you like, yeah. you want to go menthol, you get a little. I'd say I'm more consistent and stable as like a parliament light. Like, you know, what you're getting with this product, you know? I and do. Yeah. It can change like the amount of flavor, right? You could get like parliament reds. You can get Parliament Greens, but it's the same recess filter and the same taste. <laughs> yeah, and you can also... Smoke Parliament Light. <laughs> you can rip the filter off. Just raw dog. Yeah, shit. you could. And I suppose that's also another way to metaphorically connect it to your soul. Yes. Okay, sorry. I didn't... The Jazz of Physics, though, is a good book. And go check it out. If you like music, you will like it. Okay. Um, 
there was another question about dreams oh yeah yeah yeah. so i was doing some research and i saw that um dream sequence it's like uh in movies there's dream sequences Mm -hmm. um and maybe in life there's dream sequences as well but do you have a favorite movie dream sequence oh that's a good question um you know i did a lot of research too when we came up with the name dream sequence and the origin and how movies use it um i think i like maybe it's because what i'm presented with the most but like flashbacks is what my mind goes to immediately right like we use flashbacks in movies to define like you know you're going through a storyline as it is in present and then a flashback returns to a part of that storyline but it's not part of the main plot to develop more idea of why this present storyline is you know enriched in a way by the flashback um and i like that idea the concept of a flashback also i think precognitions like um like deja vus oh yeah yeah yeah. you know and um believe it or not like the original dream sequence with leo wood was supposed to be precognition but it was too good so i named it the album track Uh, i see But I like the idea of precognitions, too, a lot. Like, I think that's one of the deepest researches I went into. Okay. You can... Here, can you move the mic just slightly closer? Yeah, you're good. Um, Precognitions, I've never really heard that term. Is that synonymous with deja vu? Yes and no. So, deja vu occurs when you experience something again. All of a sudden, you have this deja vu. Oh, I've been here, you know? Uh, like, I don't know. It's actually like a pseudoscience. Millions yeah. of people. I get it. Like, I've had of, it. Yeah, pe- people experience it, but it's not something that they can put as like a factual science. So they call it pseudoscience because so many million people have reported the feeling of uh, of like a deja vu. Like, oh, I have had this feeling before. Uh, precognition is something that occurs, in my opinion, like the way that I connected it before the deja vu. So in in the essence of dreaming like you are dreaming about a, a moment a a something that happens a precognition in a sense and then when that moment occurs in real life in reality back uh-huh. to that moment then it becomes a deja vu so f- in my opinion deja vu cannot occur without a precognition or some sort of you know like a root that started that feeling well wait I've, d- I've done this before you know i've been here or this is a deja vu moment you know that is how it feels when i get deja vu i'm like oh that must have been a dream that i had or i always just try to be like the occam's razor thing where it's like the most whatever like obvious explanation is probably what it is and when i get it i think like oh no i've probably just been in a really similar situation to this and my brain thinks that i'm just like like it like matched up with like time and it just became like yeah oh this is the same moment a glitch in the this. matrix if you will yeah yeah so you know and and i think thanks to this album like i went deeper into looking at that concept of why why do we have deja vus and something that and this is the basis of our music video for time stops actually when the idea of um you have a precognition right and it's a dream let's say most of them occur for like three seconds like let's say right now this moment i'm looking at you and i see the room and it's this moment that I have in my dream, this precognition, but what I don't have is the full scope of what's happening, the full idea of the full picture. Like, for example, the best way to somebody explain it to me, you're really up close to a painting, but you have to back away to see the whole painting. That's kind of what a precognition is. It's a tiny little like piece of that moment of that painting. And when the deja vu occurs, you have a full scope of the painting, right? Like you have officially backed away to see the whole painting, but you see where your precognition fits in that moment. So it's it's such a like... It's really heady. This is the headiest <laughs> podcast I've ever done. And I love it. We did it. a lot of thinking. Like we like to... to I, I like to have symbolism in a lot of what I do. It kind of drives a lot of my creativity. Um, so like I'll create something and then we find the concept of it. So the concept is, you know, you have a precognition and it's this very happy moment, but then in reality, in deja vu, you realize it wasn't a happy moment. It was a moment of a bigger picture that you didn't realize was a negative impact or, you know, vice versa. It could have been a very negative precognition, but it was actually a very positive deja vu. Mm, so like when it actualizes, it might not necessarily, like you got a vision into what could happen. Yeah. It's, it's like, like when Raven or, or Raven Baxter from 
the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what, a Raven, right? That's a Raven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's like, oh. and then she sees it. And she's like, it's gonna be so bad. And then it happens to her, and it's like, oh, it's not. not that it bad. wasn't that bad. Exactly. We, yeah. That's exactly like the concept of that, and and that's why that's how we film the music video. It's like a double symbol, right? So it's the precognition becoming a deja vu, mm. and it's the concept of nightlife being a double edged sword. Oh, that's yeah. like a hole we could. Yeah. We go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. maybe not today, but <laughs> not today. All right. Well, you know, I feel like people are probably like, "What the fuck am I listening to?" So yeah. we'll we'll go back into like the normal podcast, which is, um, you know, I ask all my guests um, what their first concert was <sighs> that you had attended. Above and Beyond, Empire of the Sun, and I forget the third artist. I think it was ATB or Benny Ooh. Benassi. Dude. If it was ATB, that's funny, because like last night I was listening to some music with my girlfriend and that song that's like na 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 the, the yes, about. But it's like got that that uh that melody line where it's like doo, 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 and yep. it's like kind of it's got that the pitch yeah. bendy thing in it. And we were just like, We gotta figure out what this is. And it's yeah. Yeah, so ATB. Anyway. Funny enough, actually, Peggy Goo did end up using, I believe, I could be wrong, and I don't wanna be fact checked here. I'm, I'm sorry if I am incorrect, but I believe she used a sample from uh the track Till I Come by ATB. That's the song, yeah. Yep. That na 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 mm. that part? No, not that part. The um I think it's like the melody of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The part that I was like with the pitch. Yes, bending. yes, yes. Okay. It, it's it's prominent. I have to hear it right now to tell you exactly where it yeah, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us if we're accurate in the comments. Okay. <laughs> um <laughs> fact check me. Yeah. Um okay, wait, where was that that concert? It was the Congress Theater right here in <laughs> Chicago. I love when people say the Congress. Mm -hmm. It's a classic place. It's where a lot of at least my generation that you know grew up partying in chicago in our teens and, and 20s that's where we used to go yeah and i remember them talking we've talked about the congress before a few times because it ends up being people's first concert in our age range i'm 30 you're like 31 somewhere around there yeah okay 31. and um nice way to get my age without asking i like that i actually uh <laughs> You know, I might have known around where you were at from research. I'm so good. To, it's better than the way you, you, you at least you didn't say you look around 30, you know, <laughs> you, look, you look good. No, <laughs> thanks. Um, but the Congress was great. I wish they would kind of bring it back because it would just be interesting. Like they're bringing the warehouse back, like bring the Congress back. Yeah. You know, yeah, you're right. You're right. But I think they were just ridden with a lot of problems. I don't know if you've seen it. It just kind of sits there right now, it's rotting away. Yeah, yeah. It's And also when it was open was just debauchery. Like there was... It was ours and we loved it for what it was. But yeah, I'm not going to sit here in line and say that was like the most cleanest, nicest, most friendliest venue you ever went to, but it was ours. You know, no. it was where we yeah. went to go listen to music, you know, when music actually really, really mattered, I think, you know, and it's where I got my first job ever working for React Presents, selling oh, tickets. Oh, really? Oh, cool. That was like my first in job in the industry. Wow. Back when it was React. Yep. That was like, I don't know what year, 2010, 2009, 2009 maybe even? yeah they were i mean i felt like they just did every festival for a while and then it kind of split up there's a whole lineage well react became oris and collective and you know mm -hmm. it's a whole history i, I also don't really want to touch on in this yeah, podcast yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> um also just like yeah the the security at the congress i just remember and i hope this doesn't get anyone in trouble this is anecdotal um but they would just like take your stuff whatever you brought in they'd be like get the hell out of here and it was like you, you could like get back in somehow it's like, like Bergheim. like you didn't like your face you're not getting in yeah they like your face no id and take your whole bag in they just like randomly would choose you know who they would am i allowed to swear on the show you can say okay yeah. they choose what to randomly to fuck with you know what i mean and yeah yes yeah uh, also yeah. i was young too when i went to those shows like i remember i saw nero at and it was like dylan francis was yeah i sold i sold tickets to that really yeah i did dude that was a fun <laughs> show me and my buddy were sitting in the like upper area and we were just looking down and we we're like this guy's doing a good job and it was just dylan francis like right. no one was really fucking around like, funny story about dylan francis i was just in amsterdam at ade 
and I'm outside uh, having a parliament and um, and I don't smoke. I quit in case my wife is listening. But you were in Europe. I was in Europe, right? And you you can't yeah. quit in Europe. You only start and you start again. You know and Right. Um, so I step outside of the bar and I'm having a cigarette with my friends and I see, uh, Dylan, I think Dylan Francis is his name, right? He doesn't go by another name. I think, uh, yeah, I think it, that's his name. So he walks by and I'm like, oh wait, that's, and I froze up because I didn't know if it, I should call him Hansel, if I should call him Dylan <laughs> Francis. So I'm like, wait, so I grab his show. I'm like, you're, he looks at me, he's like, no, I'm not Hansel. See ya. And just <laughs> <laughs> walks away. And it was like such a funny moment i kind of felt weird i'm like why didn't i call him dylan francis you know no i understand that feeling where you're like you're like a big figure in my life maybe he's not a huge figure in your life but like he's, you just get kind of like ah, i can't think well it wasn't starstruck because like at ade it's like everyone's there like you're, i ran into nikki romero and david Guetta and oh, okay, everyone okay. all and their agencies and everyone's kind of like on the same plane there you know what i mean in a sense uh, but it was more of like, fuck, why did I forget your name? What was your name? It's Dylan Francis, but he walked away already. Uh, but yeah, he was, he was really cool about it. He was like, yeah, I'm not Hansel. Bye. You yeah, know? Von Deeper. Yeah. yeah, and you put the accent on too. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> that's funny. I mean, yeah, ADE. So ADE is a convention, but is it like a tech? It's like a conference. It's like a conference. Yeah, yeah. but it's like, a, it's an industry conference, music industry. So it's called Amsterdam Dance Event, which now I kind of understand it's better than saying Amsterdam Dance Festival or Amsterdam Dance Conference because it's both of those. There is multiple festivals happening all over Amsterdam at the same time, while uh, simultaneously there's like uh, the Felix Marides and the, the Pulitzer and the Andas where a lot of networking was occurring, right? Like you go into the bars and it would, it would be totally normal to run into like somebody from Wasserman or, you know, it's an agency and yeah. somebody like Insomniac, you know, and, and everyone's kind of communicating. And the, the idea is that you are there to network. You are there to meet people and, and expand your contact and network. And then there's another part like MAPA and Lincoln Co where they did a lot of the workshops. So like I, I went to a pioneer mm -hmm. workshop where they had a pioneer um, instructor, I don't know what the right word is, instructor, I guess. He did like a whole showcase on the new squid that's coming out for Pioneer and how to use it as a live set in your music, how to create, you know, um, like more live music while you're DJing. And that was really cool. I attended like SoundCloud's conference and it was... Oh, really? Yeah. How do you like go about going to them? Do you get... Is it like... So you gotta buy tickets, you gotta get invited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy a ticket. I got the pro pass. Um, I planned to go a while ago. I work with a PR company called Matt Caldwell, and they always have like uh, Matt himself actually is one of the meet the agents that you would go into a conference and meet to talk to about Matt Caldwell. Um, but they invited me originally to come meet the team when I've been working with them for a year since we've been, you know, they, they came on board when the album was coming out. So we've been virtually speaking to each other i'm up at nine there's 4 p.m over there in malta in the uk so mm. i it was an opportunity to meet and i'm really glad i did like i stepped in the office i got to meet the rest of the team realized that there's so much more to the pr company that i didn't know about you know and in that sense it was great so that's how i got like like that's why i went to ade mm. uh, but then there's also the diligent part so it's easy to party we we work in the party scene you know yeah. So to go and stay up till 8 a.m. in the morning, not a problem in Amsterdam. And then you can find your way into another party at 9 a.m. So I had to separate my time. I wanted to go in with intention. I need to meet the people that are involved in the head of things that I want to do. I need to go attend these conferences. I need to go to these networking events. Like I listened to Joseph K. Priati and how he made it. And I sat in with an Ableton uh, workshop uh, instructor and watch how you utilize different ways to use drum machines, you know? And it's just good to see different processes because you're always adding to your process, you know? And so that was very good for me at ADE. Yeah, that's awesome. No, it sounds super helpful. And the yeah. networking aspect. So the the um, PR people or the- MCPR, yeah. The But you were saying like the agency that you were working with, right? Yeah. Um, did you bring them on just to do kind of like uh, promotional stuff or? So, because it's a self released album. Right. Independently, completely independent, all of it. Like yeah. Between the mixing, it's all my own team of, of people that I work with, um, which was a big step. Like, I, 
you know, people aren't really releasing albums and to get the attention of people listening to a whole album, it's just not as common. Um, so I knew I was taking a risk here, but I also didn't want the album to sit there. I wanted to have this full campaign that came with it. And that meant like producing my own first merchandise line, creating music videos, the live stream on the boat that just came out. Um, and all of this, while I'm busy creating, I realized like I don't have the capabilities of getting this content into other places. Oh yeah, you no, know I get I get what you're saying. Yeah, because so like you only have so much of your network, right? And and my network has been extremely receptive, which is always the most important, in my opinion, as an artist to have your inner circle or your first inner ring of people that are you know honest with you about the music you're writing and your your work, telling you it sucks if it sucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's important. Not just being surrounded by yes men. Yeah, and a lot of people yeah. will say yes, yes, yes. And so that's hard. You gotta pick those people that are not gonna tell you yes all the time. Um, and so when I started realizing like I need to get a little more publication and you know just public relations in general, publicity, um, I started shopping around for different PR companies. And I've talked to a bunch of people, but I really connected with Matt Caldwell and what I liked about them the most, they weren't eager immediately to be like, yeah, yeah, we're ready to sign you. We're, mm. we're like, hey, uh, let us listen to your track. Thanks for reaching out. We'll get back to you. And they did. They took a week. They listened through my music. They did the research, you know, like diligently searched and looked at my mom's Facebook page and whatever it is. And <laughs> inside joke, maybe we'll cut it in later. <laughs> um, and they were like, hey, we really like this album. We really like this. We don't think you're doing very well in this place. We think you could do better here. Here's like a custom package that we want to do for you. Um, aside from that, like they really believed in the product. So they fully came on board behind me, which was like as an artist is very validating to have a team of people that have a million of artists reaching out to them to want to actually help push my PR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially that they were like playing a little hard to get at first. They were like, yeah, yeah well check it everybody out. likes somebody you know everybody likes that <laughs> hard to get vibe you know i think it's just an important metric for like you know when you're getting a team together for people who are actually going to help you like i think yeah there's a lot of people that might just be kind of parasitic and like yeah we'll help you and then it's like then you have to yeah. you have to go through that yeah you can't skip that part because then you won't be able to recognize it's like precognitions and deja vus you have to have those precognition to recognize when the deja vu is coming. And we tie it all back. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> Pam, I love there it. There we go. Yeah, nice. Um, cool. Well, yo, I think I think we listened to just a track and kind of give people a little taster. Um, is there anyone in particular that you'd like to listen to? Also, wow, I'm such an idiot. You're going to ask We're, me what my favorite track is? While you think about your track, um, I would also like to introduce that Chandler uh, is co-hosting today and uh i'm so sorry i didn't introduce you earlier oh, you know when anyone like you're staring at me and i'm in the corner <laughs> good surprises <laughs> good surprises come later you know yes but <laughs> hello true. everyone you're not going to see my face today but you will hear my voice so nice to be introduced on this channel and hope to see you soon but yes anyway thank you so much for being here <laughs> thank you for having me and jerry met at electric forest and ever since then we've just got on it so i'm glad you're electric here. forest where at the evil <laughs> after <laughs> and that's where i met you Alex. funny so enough we, we all met we were supposed to do this at evil afters and to be honest i'm glad that we're doing it here me too it's sound me way too. better me too and also i think like you saw like the amount of work that comes with all of that oh yeah there was a lot going yeah, on so. everyone was sweaty there you, was you got lot. me now it yeah. was too much honestly it's better to have this intimate moment right now for sure because before i think everyone was just a little too hot a little too wet yeah no you, when you're glistening <laughs> on camera it's just like yeah. it's a no yeah, well i can also imagine i'm sitting there with the radio and like i'm listening like, to like, all go. the teams and i'm like wait a second hold on it's like you know running to different parts of the stages and stuff so yeah it's a lot shout out evil oh yeah Always um, shout out Evol. Oh, we got a. I don't know if anyone can see this, but it's an Evol little <laughs> mm -hmm. Easter egg behind was me. Actually, on the phone with Misha the other, he helped me with my merchandise. We can get to touch oh, on that later. Beautiful, beautiful. I have a little uh, electric forest wristband on my mic here. Nice. Um, yeah, my mic is festival, <laughs> festivaled out, festied out. Yeah. Um, okay. Welcome, Chandler. Uh yeah, what track should we uh should we start with? 
We'll listen to a couple. I don't know as many. If as you want to listen to a couple, I mean, might as well start with the first one. Um, yes. Do you, Anything you'd like to say about yes. it beforehand? I'd also like to say that uh, there's a very talented singer on the track. Indeed. The talented singer, Ali Mess, is short for Elizabeth Mesham, which is my wife, who's now Elizabeth Kislov. Uh, and this is the first track we ever put together. And I really like, you know, I really like what this track became, right? It's our collaboration, but it's also the perfect prologue, the beginning of your dreams, the beginning of the journey you're about to take when you listen to the album. And um, Eliza is an amazing singer. I discovered her when I was playing the ukulele and she was singing. And we've been trying to find a song to do, and this is it. So I'm really, really proud of this one. And I'm really happy it's the first track in the album. Dope. Yeah, let's run it. How's your levels? I feel like mine could go up a little bit. Could go. Mike is fine, but the sound can go up a little bit. Yeah. That's perfect. Oh yeah. That's oh, beautiful. That's, the beauty that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's Which? the G sharp spot, right? That's what they call it. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I just made it up. That's pretty good. <laughs> that might be a T-shirt. Yeah. It's got t-shirt potential. Maybe my new merch. <laughs> the G-sharp spot. <laughs> yeah, I like this. It's dreamy, dude. The whole thing's dreamy. Yeah, th this one was meant to start the dream. Nighttime. You're, you're rolling into the beginning of your dream sequences, you know? Mm. You guys plan on making any more music together yes in short yes um you know being married comes with its uh with its things and uh first we have to agree on on the track which means she has to make it and i will agree with it <laughs> oh okay does she does she ever dabble in the production no that's me well that's she does play the ukulele she's very talented um i've i've seen her play instruments so she definitely has music um, but she's a nurse, a nurse practitioner to be exact. And so that's her career. And she's a very, very excellent nurse. Oh my God. That just reminded me too. I was, I don't remember where this was from, but you said in one of the interviews that you do dog boarding at your house. Uh -huh. And so do I. Oh, are you on Rover? I, so I have a company called Boy Meets Dog. <laughs> Whoa. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So literally the day before there was a dog here and then tomorrow i'm getting a dog and i just had, two dog dogs. At home. Yeah. I had one leave yesterday and one staying with us for two weeks right now so it's let's go yeah we we pretty we're pretty serious dog boarders we're star sitter status dude i gotta get on rover i just never did it i just do it if you have your own business and clientele then i'm sorry rover i hope they don't cancel <laughs> my account on this you can cut the middleman out right i know that's but they're extremely good at finding you the clients and producing like this whole portfolio of who you are and past, you know, yeah. clients that you've had. So it makes it good. And if you're a star sitter, they push your name up to the top of the list as well. I mean, I feel like it's just good to be on the, all the platforms. Like yeah. they say, this is like when they say like, dude, you got to be on TikTok. It's like, dude, you got to be on Rover yeah. if you're a dog boarder. For sure. You do. Honestly. Yeah. If, if you have windows of time that you can get more dogs in, then yeah, Rover would fill it in. Yeah. So do you like it I love it's, it. it's do you have a dog yourself currently no but, i don't currently yeah because yeah, you don't, don't need a dog so it all it started we wanted to adopt a uh -huh. dog and we we're like well let's try rover our friends were doing it so we're like we started watching dogs and 
then we realize, well, okay, this dog goes home and we're done and I don't have to worry about the vet bills later, you know, or anything like that. You're speaking my mind. Exactly. So we just kept doing it. Next thing you know, two years in and 87 dogs later, we're literally like... Yo, just... congrats. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Dude, we should like actually like talk and be like... Let's have a dog date. Well, because we could be like, like sometimes I can't take on clients and it's like maybe you... Same. Yeah yeah definitely we gotta talk yeah this yep. is post podcast if you're listening right make sure to hire us to board your dog <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um do you have a favorite dog breed you know i always love poodles i grew up with a poodle anything oh. poodle like cockapoo the doodles my favorite name is a cockapoo yeah um and then there is like yeah the doodles the doodles you know the doodles are taking over so that's they're great they're hypoallergenic they're family dogs they don't imprint onto one person so they're very good for a large family or small family friendly not needy easy to train very intelligent so i love the poodle always will but recently discovered i very much love the dutch hunt the dogs oh, dachshunds yes oh my god they're Love. so cute they have so much attitude these like they have so much personality oh, it's crazy. it might be too much it's huge it's massive personalities and i didn't realize that they're so i can't explain it they're just you you have a dachshund you know what i'm talking about like the stubbornness with the cuteness and the yeah yeah it's the so little babies big big so we might get a poodle mix with a dachshund oh interesting yeah a doxapoo is probably i don't think i've ever seen one of those uh i think i've seen one i haven't watched one but i've seen it okay yeah but imagine being hypoallergenic with that larger than life attitude like yeah it's like a perfect mix i always fear getting a dog because then i'm like oh, what if they don't mix well with the dogs that i'm taking on and that's the only reason that the trepidation so you know that's the good thing about having repeat clients you get to know the dog's personality yeah. like we uh, we're really getting into this let's go uh, we're, we're into it we're, <laughs> we're in it for this. this can be a small we segment go from the heady let's get into your dreams to like i really love dogs yeah yeah, yeah 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 uh we have a we have a dog we watch regularly maggie and she's amazing amazing dog like i would totally have a dog like that if i decide to adopt full-time um and maggie gets along with all of the dogs mm. so we know that we can have maggie uh, simultaneously with other dogs then we'll have other dogs that don't like to be around other dogs generally smaller have the smaller dog complex you know oh yeah so we avoid that and that's when we actually work with our friends to have alternative boarding as well yes we're gonna build a network i see money in our future i actually know for I real see barking and money in the future <laughs> i have a dog named lady who's very uh much always on the scene she's always coming over mm, and loves the attention she's yeah she's kind of a needy dog but she's a food good motivated dog. food motivated for sure so yeah usually that those correlate you'll notice like the dogs that require more attention are generally the ones that are more food motivated mm -hmm. i also i've seen and play sometimes it's play too like they're right. just like just need love gotta get yeah, yeah. gotta do just something. rub the belly rub yeah. behind the ear just look at me all yes. the time 24 7 and don't look away chandler <laughs> are you a cat or dog person um are you in this i am a both person okay i grew up with dogs i have two cats that are insane but I do like both. I want a dog, though. I want to have the whole, you know, maybe a snake in there, maybe a reptile. Ooh, I actually have a snake. This is what's the, his name? Or her her name? name is Nagini. Oh, a ball that. python. Uh, yeah, and a West African ball python. She's approximately six feet now, dude. That's fantastic. Yeah, she stays in her cage. Snake. Her and my wife never communicate. They don't fuck around. Never. Yeah. No, no. Ever <laughs> since her, me and my wife started dating, she's like, mm. leave, I have to leave it in the closet for a little while. Oh. My my yaya, my grandma uh yeah she yeah. that's greek for grandma and she, she hated snakes yeah. that was like her biggest fear well it's normal believe it or not it's in our biology to actually to hate snakes um i mean how do they move i've talked about this they're before just they're just like around. slithering they got no arms they're just like what's up dude you're like fuck you <laughs> they actually there's they're like beautiful. a there's like a, a video or an article from harvard university again fact check me on this but um they had a baby a toddler put in front of a snake and the toddler's eyes would dilate sensing fear so it's like ingrained in our biology to be fearful of snakes that makes sense right i mean it's uh, back in the day they were our main predators right that tigers but everything else that ate you and had teeth but snakes were very good they were very quiet they were very efficient and killing 
Oh, yeah. it depends on what kind of snake you're in front of, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you're in front of, like, just a little guy, he's just a little guy. <laughs> just a little, little garter yeah, snake. Yeah, but don't be fooled, right? Because the little guys also can be venomous. And, True. You know, so True. that's what we develop fear altogether from snakes because, that's right. you know, you never know what you're stepping in. Last thing you want to yeah. see is a snake in the wild. I can, I have a snake at home and I don't want to see a snake in the wild. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, not in the wild. Yeah. Like, you know. In a regular setting, okay. Yeah, like Nagini, she I got her. She was a baby. She used to fit in my palm. Now Nagini to, yeah. is that from something? Harry Potter. Oh, it's one of Voldemort's Horcruxes. That's his guy. Yeah, yeah, dude. Same, same snake breed as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You really Great got the specifics there. I like details. It's all about the detail. <laughs> no, as I we can see. It. I love that. Um, I also saw that you had a menagerie is that what the, i looked up the term menagerie. it's basically that might not be how you say it but basically you have like, are you asking me about my lingerie <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm sorry all right move over to only fans for this next yeah, one yeah yeah <laughs> yes menagerie is a men version of lingerie <laughs> i looked at, i saw the term and I, I had to look it up and i was like ah anyway i shouldn't have brought it up i was what is it unfamiliar with the term but basically what i'm trying to say is that you've had many different types of animals and oh ant farms. yes yeah oh my god ant yeah, farm shrimp turtles and you wanted to be a vet yes so my whole life i loved love still animals and i used to be the the person you know back in my homeland where i would literally see a herd animal like a bird or even hit bats in my closet i would bring it home and my mom was terrified of everything that moved so i kept it in my closet in my room and the bats in the closet so, yeah i found a bat and its wing was broken and i literally took it home and it healed and flew around my house and literally scared the shit out of everyone Dude, in my building we've had a bat in my dad's house that's the most erratic yeah, because the they can't they see. <laughs> and yeah. if sonar is hitting it from everywhere, it continues to fly until it finds a safe space and yeah. usually won't when there's human in the room because it can't bear, like find its bearing. Mm -hmm. But so you have an affinity for animals. Yes, big time. Love animals. I love, I think, I don't know what it is. I just love how different they are from us as humans, right? Like it's easy because we live as humans so we know our, our physiology, whatever. Like reptiles are so different. They're cold blooded. They don't eat for six months. They uh, have survived past humanity and before humanity. You know what I mean? Like it, I, I believe reptiles will continue to live on Earth even when humans don't. You know, uh, and they just found a way to cohabitate while also uh, the longevity of reptiles in comparison to small animals. Like for example, a hamster will live for three years. A snake will live for thirty years. Why is that? You know, and I find it fascinating. Then. I don't know. I'm the key, I'm the weird kid that used to feed spider webs. You know what I mean? Like back when I was younger. What was would you feed them? Just like ants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like little bugs. Yeah. One I'm, time I got a cicada to fly into like a big spider dude, web, and I was like, nice. Spider web? Did you, dude? That sounds. Dude, it cute. was a big meal. Like Spider Man's web? Like what is that? <laughs> you know when? You know when the when it, like it's around spooky season around now, and there's just like crazy spiders outside there's this little street over here that i called spider town because mm -hmm. every time i walk the dogs over there i gotta like duck and dodge the spider webs mm -hmm. but i don't know what kind of spiders they are but they can be like like a quarter size and i got one i mean i felt bad actually after the cicada flew into it but there's so many and they're like uh, see, real dumb it's natural and feeling bad is again a human feeling because that is just natural way of life it's a natural order of things and I think that it's not that my brain doesn't work in sympathy. I do have sympathy. I just think that what I love about animals too is the pragmatic parts of it. It doesn't overthink things. It survives, you know, and not to say that I think I'm, I'm saying this all wrong right now, but the idea is that um, like we humans like to have patterns. We like to put things in ways that make sense for us to process why they're being done that way. Whereas animals don't operate in those guidelines they don't have that higher conscious thinking um and so i think that's very fascinating to me in general yeah dude planet earth mm -hmm. whenever they drop a new planet earth i'm just like did, did you ever read those magazines zoo, zoo something zoo animals utopia i don't remember. oh yeah like they would Wild, wildlife like, remember like the book fair at school yeah 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 yeah. and they look like national geo but they're not they're like specifically for animals i think i know what you're talking so, about i can't i read all of them 
as a child, like when growing up in America, when I moved here and I was reading in English, that was the main magazine I would go to. My mom had a subscription for me and everything. Nice. Yeah. Love animals. Huge, huge love for animals. I, I don't know why I thought, but when you said the bat, I saw an article and like a news blurb, whatever, about the salt shed. This is a Chicago thing. The salt shed, they had like a bat that was there during a show and they were like, if you were, you know, if you encountered the bat and it bit you or something like bats can carry rabies. Yeah, and like, you know how COVID got started, whatever. The- <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I was just like, what? Is that just like a liability thing? Because like bats can have rabies. So sure, but even more fascinating is that bats can actually carry several different types of bacteria without being infected by it or dying off of diseases. In fact, they're one of the cleanest animals and, and its blood is very sus- like uh not susceptible the opposite the it's like anti <sighs> i don't know what the word is like not a scientist i'm a dj <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the idea is that like you, you they are very good at testing for carrying different types of pathogens interesting so okay, yeah definitely avoid sense. bats because you don't know what they carry and they can mm-hmm. carry a lot of things that could kill you and they could be vampires they could be more than yeah I, I, yeah probably most both bats are bad have bats. you seen those bats that are like huge like they're literally like dog Fruit size bats. The, but the big ones yeah. is that the brazilian ones or something like that they're like in south america and they're literally like this big they're yeah huge. they're gargoyles humongous. at that point there's not a bat anymore they're and humongous. i'm saying this big for people who can't see i'm opening my arms all the way up yeah <laughs> no their wings look terrifying like no it's awful yeah they're they're scary for sure like we have a natural uh, fear of bats as well i mean a flying mouse that bites you and can carry disease is pretty freaking scary you know don't like that yeah they're and kind of cute though. but also cute no it can be cute. no i yeah. think i think all animals can be cute uh-huh you even just, like a yeah like when they get really zoomed in on like a tarantula and it's just like the little eyes oh, yeah. and you're like that's kind of cute mm. but then you're like and then it just yeah, rips know, apart the that. tarantula batman style and yeah mm. Yeah, dude. I don't know. I don't really. You know what I fear the most, and but we're just really down the rabbit hole. That's fine. We'll we'll we'll, we'll round this. I out forgot what we were. What were we here for? Hey, uh, music. <laughs> no, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> my fear, and I've realized this, is like things that I can't see, like bugs that are really small but mm. carry like diseases and stuff, like, uh, like ticks, ticks, and uh, and mosquitoes, and mosquitoes, mm. and there's like. What else was there? Scabies? That's gross. Yeah. Bed yeah. bugs? Yeah. Nasty. Oh, I hate bed Dude, bugs. Dude, all that shit? Because you can't see it. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the worst. Like swimming in the dark when you can't see in front of you or under you, you're a little set panic. You know I what I mean? I don't like that either. Yeah. yeah that's it's, a phobia. Believe it or not, those phobias are precautions to protect yourself. Going back to like biology and it's in our DNA to do, to have these. <sighs> worrisome yeah. feeling it's like a self-surviving mechanism well, it's i don't know you, you yeah. dream too about it like i recently i was you know talking to somebody that i was i'm in a garden apartment now and i'm always dreaming congrats. of eating spiders oh you got no bugs. congrats oh, yeah. there's I'm bugs sorry. all over that thing <laughs> oh no. yeah when i lived in a garden oh no well just wait till winter they die off oh no there's more <laughs> they love it in there it's that, the you hotel got, you got a hotel in there, oh yeah. no 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 so you i'm got, always you know asking people like do you have any reoccurring dreams where you're eating bugs or you know you're getting hit by lightning or something hmm. we'll tie in the heady with oh the, with yeah the, no we gotta do that the, the dream talk i like this because mm-hmm. i i am a big dream like person where you're talking about why you're dreaming about those things so i don't know if you have anything maybe while you were writing this album mm. so the name of the album came after Mm-hmm. like the the writing part of it so it was written throughout many years like dating back over to 2017 so like i have tracks that were made way ahead you know way before and i made the subconscious decision okay i am doing an album and i'm releasing it on my own and i'm going to start working on this and that was like big end of 2022 beginning of 2023 and i started sifting through projects and i chose obviously the i had like 50 tracks that i put in there and i started weaning it down to the selection of 15 down to five and then made five more um man i think i forgot (laughs) dream dream um do you dream of certain like do you have reoccurring dreams of things like heady dreams during Mm. the process so believe it or not all my music videos have been dreams that i had like all of them kind of came to me as like a dream and i don't dream often i'll have dreams rarely and ironically enough 
mostly when it's a full moon. I don't know why. Don't ask me. I don't want to get it's into very that meta part. Of you. I don't know why, but I'm noticing that when I will remember a dream when I wake up, and oftentimes you don't remember any of them, it will be like around the time that it's a moon that's full. Do you do any? Sorry, do you do anything else during a? Like, are you aware of the moon cycle? Like, no, there's nothing you do around when the moon is full that like could. I'm noticing people's like craziness level goes up a little bit. Like, you I, don't do like your. I have monthly... a theory on it too, and and I heard it recently in a movie. I guess I'm not the only one that thinks this way, but we are made of water, eighty percent, and the moon has its own gravitational pull. Every time it's a full moon, there is a stronger wake, and the water gets pulled a little bit more from the earth. The same occurs to us. We are being pulled from the moon while also having a gravitational pull of the earth. That can cause different cells to work differently. I'm feeling that. I would agree. I mean, 80% water, is. there's no way that the moon isn't pulling us when it's full, you know, in my opinion. I, mean, I can make that. Elections joke. are usually during full moons, too, mm. which is when people get really crazy and there's a lot going on. But not to bring that up. Let's get political. <laughs> no, Who no, are no, you no. voting for? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Throw it in the oh, trash. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, for, yeah. I vote for Ableton and Joseph Capriati. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Love that. Um, yeah, do you... Speaking on the dreams, I had a dream last night uh, where I was just late for school. And like, oh my God, I always have those. Where I'm was, like in the hall, like having a panic attack. Yeah, and you know what I get to? I'll like have a class and then like in the dream, I'll be like, dude, I didn't go to that class all semester. Like I'm... I'm fucked. Yeah, and then your final test. Like, I just... Is it just yeah. like childhood trauma? I don't just know. being it like, could hey. be. Yeah, maybe it's unpacking in your RAM mode, you know. But uh, as far as my dreams go, it's usually obscure. Like, like walking and there's like things turning into color, which how Shining became a music video. Um, and then like dreams about flying to different places or playing different shows. That kind of touched how I want to feel became... I do have a reoccurring dream that I remember often, but it's in my childhood, not as an adult. And that's me sitting at the edge of a cliff on a very nice movie theater seat, like a red seat. And I'm overlooking the cliff and all of a sudden this chair begins to fall over and I'm falling. I'm, it, I'm still like consciously in my dream awake of the fall, but before I hit the ground, I wake up. Mm. And apparently a lot of people have dreams about falling. It means growth. Mm. Yeah. I yeah I'll have those dreams where I think I'm falling and then I'll like jerk up yeah, yeah. jolt into awakeness yeah but that's specific yours is like you're like in a movie theater like watching yeah it's just one chair at the edge of a cliff it's like a sh very short cliff and all of a sudden it starts to tip over the cliff and I'm falling and before I hit the ground I wake up have you ever done a dream journal or like tried to actively mm, I can't add any more journals, to <laughs> no more journals. <laughs> I journal my to-do list, my memory, like everything. Like uh, throughout the day, I go through three different notepads that I'm journaling on. And do you use your phone or do you do the physical? Both. Okay. So long term on my phone because I can just, I like to have a notepad because my mind onto the paper, it becomes reality. Something I need to do or it becomes my to-do list or becomes something, a goal, essence, right? On my phone, it's easy to ignore it, you know? It's like, oh, yeah. no, it's 158 more of those I notes. do both now, because for a while, yeah, anything on my phone, like, didn't actually exist. That's right. the way I felt. Yeah, yeah like, and it's, yeah. it's because we have different usages for our phone, right? Like, when you, yeah. get a, you get text messages, so you're accustomed to, you know, and you don't really... It, it's habit, like building habits. For sure, yeah, and also, like... Yeah, you could, this is like a portal into a million distractions. Mm, that's an understatement. It's, yeah, you're just like, oh, I'm on, I've been on Instagram for 15 minutes. Why did I do that? <laughs> I don't know. You're just yeah. scrolling through reels or, you know. Yeah. Well, it depends. If you're a content creator, it's kind of now your job to be on Instagram. To be aware of what's out there. That and just, I don't know about you, but I spend like so much time overthinking everything I'm putting out. All these the videos. Timing, the timing. Yeah. The, 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 is this a good enough video is the is the yeah is the is the capture like the con the caption good enough is it going to capture people you know constantly think overthinking content yeah and i feel like with the pr stuff i feel like that might is that helping a little bit take off some of that it helped to have more content now my problem is that i don't know you gotta post what it. to yeah. post you know between the music video to the stream to the album to the merchandise to the shows to everything that's getting put out i want to make sure everything has its space that people can have time to process what i'm putting out there without feeling like i'm jumping too much you know yeah no i get that call it marinating your content it's weird because it's like 
I've been thinking about this lately. I'm basically just on this thing where I'm like, I just post when I want almost. I try to keep things interesting. Let's just put it that way. Um, but like, it's good to post more for the algorithm because the algorithm wants to see that you're active. But for people, they start getting kind of like tired of seeing all this stuff. Right. You and know? then so also it's, like, it's, it's hard work. It's like a lot of work and time to continuously pump out content to keep feeding the algorithm, to keep getting into the timeline, to keep, you know, yeah, yeah. one thing leads to the next. And, and your mind now, I mean, there was a time where, oh, I'm going to post a picture of me and my family on Instagram. It, you, it was so innocent. You're not thinking about what content it's going to be. You know what I mean? Before, I guess, the time of influencers. I'm dating myself right now. but No, I'm, I'm with you. Um, like, there was a time where you just, you know, like Vine, right? Where you would just make funny videos and they didn't need to be viral or reels. You know, and people just made funny content. And that turned into reels and Instagram. And there was a time I would just post what's happening in my life or updates on, on the photos. Now it doesn't feel like... It doesn't feel right as much. It's not organic anymore mm -hmm. because, you know, Instagram became a job. Yeah. So now you're not getting those, here's my family photo album and here's the things I'm doing. Because back in the day, it was like you could go on Facebook and it was like, You'd name the photo album something funny yep. of the weekend and Congress were, Theater Congress with Nero, Theater. you know, yeah. You know, absolutely. And it was like this whole experience. But now because people make money on, you know, content platforms it's not as organic anymore and it's not as you know something yeah. like that and some people it's a business deal yeah in a way. people live on it it's your it's your it's your salary your job right so now you know you have to pump out content and oh, yeah. when you have to do something the creativity gets curved a little bit right because it's a job it's something that is do you do better with a stress or do you do better when you have like space i think it depends so i when i'm stressed i am locked in I know that there is so much going on and I strategize the next few days to make sure that I am keeping up with everything that's happening. So the stress makes me work harder. Having the space, which is what I did with the album, actually, I gave myself a lot of space to keep adding content or keep creating content or keep designing new concept for this content. Um, and in that regard, it was, it was great. I had so much room, time, and the ability to see what I wanted to do with my album. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I mean, that makes sense. It's it's always good to have a good mix of both. Mm. I'm a person, I need to be so stressed out, I can't see. And then I'm like the best person, <laughs> yeah, which is car, not healthy. Let's lock in, yeah. You know, but no, I think, you know, creatives have that struggle where it's like, you need to like go sit on a beach and then you're going to have the vision of an album or something. You yeah, know? but you're sitting on that beach, you're like, damn, did I, did I master this mix <laughs> right? Like, did I, did yeah. I do, the, did I answer these interviews? Did I play this side that I, you know, like different things that start to run in your head of what you didn't do, you know? And I think it's good to have stress in, in obviously in limitations, but I think giving yourself a lot of time without worrying about the time that it takes will give you room to not rush things. Sure. So like what, the, what I love about the release of this album, I didn't rush it. I already was ready to release it Thanksgiving last year. I'm like, no. I'm gonna release it in in October, and I designed a merchandise collection to be made for fall, so that when it got shipped out, people are now actually wearing it. You know, it gave me the ability to strategize ahead of time for what the lookout for the album could be. So, like the merchandise was fall orientated, winter orientated. I knew it needed to release in that time. I knew that I needed time to film the music video. That took us three and a half weeks between, uh, you know, three days to film, but then three and a half weeks to get the editing team and the coloring correction, and we have. Um, an animator, actually, the guy that does the animation for the Sphere in Vegas was the one that designed the jellyfish and time stops. Oh, cool. Yeah. Fire. Well, that took four or five days. Crazy. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Well, I live there for yeah. sure. Yeah, a little flex, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that takes time. And, and not having time when you're rushing through content, now I'm rushing my team. And now everyone is in this stress to, to develop or to, to release. And that's when you are, again, curbing your creativity, your oh, fuck, we got to get this out right now. Oh, damn it, this is coming out next week. Oh, no, the album is out next week. I didn't have that feeling. It's like, okay, yeah. I got time to pitch it on Spotify. I got time to promote this to the PR. You know, I had time to really go through everything thoroughly and have the details added to it, which is what was very important for me to do it as an independent artist. Sure. I knew that I want to independently release it because of all these details I wanted to go and It's also it. yours. It's your timeline, yeah. whatever you want. You know, and do you think like, what is your perfect recipe 
when you're starting some of these tracks? Like when you're like, okay, we're sat down to the album. I've got an idea. What's your recipe? What's going into it? In the creative, like the writing process. Mm -hmm. So there isn't like a recipe. I, you know, we're not reinventing a wheel. So it's okay to take a track that inspires you. Like, for example, I have huge influences from an artist called Marsh. And I'll take a track and I'll break it down. I'll, I'll see how he did his hooks, how he wrote his arps, where the breakdown is, you know, and kind of lay it out. And then utilizing this structure to start producing my own idea from it. I'll strip it from everything that came from the track and then add my own elements to it. Then I'll invite maybe somebody like my friend John, right? John is an extremely, incredibly talented m film scoring. So he has such a different brain for music. He looks at music in a very, like, mathematical way so he'll come in and hear a song like, like music theory type yeah way. but th further than that right like creating uh like you'd be like hey can you create an energetic vibe oh yeah b flat sharp blah 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 these are the keys you should be playing he knows that well in movies it's also mm -hmm. you're creating an emotion and a feeling mm -hmm. that's not represented quite there yet or right. it is and you want to make it you know extra film scoring is great like it if really you is. don't have the music you're just like what am i supposed to feel right now right Exactly. Yeah. Like if you've ever seen a movie without sound, it's kind yeah. of dry. You know, it adds a lot. It adds the color. So yeah. I, I like to think of it as like a coloring book. You have your song and it's the lines for what to color in, but you are the one coloring it in. You're not designing a new picture. It's already been drawn before. The circle's already been made or a square's already been penciled in. Now it's your job to make it a square that isn't fully shaped like a square, but has a bit of a circle in it, but still four shapes. And it's blue and purple, you know. Adding these extra touches is the best metaphor to explaining the creative process of writing music. So I, I use that when I feel like I need a crutch to get up off of, you know, into writing. When I wrote this album, I had no creative issues. I knew that I wanted to write and I just wrote from the heart. And this whole album is, you know, there's always an issue like what I play can sometimes be different than what I produce because how I'm feeling at the time that I'm producing is different than what I'm feeling when I need to feel, you know, get the dance floor moving. Um, and so writing an album, I was able to touch on all that listening music, dance music, scoring music, you know. Do you, cool. do you feel like, because uh, I feel that, I don't know, I can't make bangers at home. And I've made some that are like, you know, strong, um, but it's hard to get hyped up just in your own room i feel like i end up making real chill stuff um but i feel like with the music from dream sequence there's obviously it being like housey you know having a yeah. dance back bone that there's still energy in it but it can be really dreamy and ethereal and mm -hmm. kind of have both i've always really enjoyed music that has that where it's energetic go hard but also is really delicate and soft at times mm. too. So that comes from my influence, like listening to trance and deep house and drum and bass, right? Like I love a good bass line, but I need melodies to keep me peaked at interest, you know? And what I'm noticing a lot of music, specifically like in the tech house genre, they don't really have any melodic elements. It's mostly percussion, bass line, some synth stabs, bah, and pa, 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 pa. just never connected fully to that. Like I can, I've written tracks like that. You have to, because... It's what we're surrounded by. It's essentially like, you know, what it comes down to. But melodies were always my forte, my my signature. Like, you, if I have to say, like, there's a signature to my sound, it's the way that I incorporate my arps with my my pads. That's what I was about to say. So, like, I have a way that I'll layer pads and the way that I layer arps together. And I like that they do, like, a call and repeat with each other. And then the bass line, for me, is always, like, where the groove lives, where the, the percussion and the bass line live. It's where the set standard the stable part of the track but then you have room to move your melodies and that's what keeps your brain interested mm -hmm. does it go for like normally once i got my chords i'll like just put it in an arpeggio and be like that's fucking yes yeah <laughs> but do you you do you go the extra step i mean sometimes you don't have to go the extra step and change the arpeggiated part from the chord so, so I'll, i don't know i'll take that arp and then i'll copy it six times and then try different sounds and then layer them Right. So then, sure. and then I will EQ it. So, like, I like the high end of this one, but I like the low end of that. And then I will put them in a group together and, and start, you know, gluing them, compression and all that stuff. And it creates a whole new sound that isn't fully there yet. So that becomes your sound. Right. Um, I like to do, like I said, there's a call and response. So let's say, like, a, a ARP has four notes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I'll skip the third on one and have it 
boom, 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 you know? Uh, and that one's a little longer or whatever. Yeah, well, there's an introduction of a sound that's like, whoa, I didn't hear that there. That's what I call ear candy. Your ears hear it and you're like, oh, I really like the way that sounds, you know? And and I used a lot of that in my the last track in the album, um, No Sleep, Too Close, um, where I used like... Like when I wrote that track, it was only melodies and and arps and different things. I obviously added a kick to give it a little groove. It's one of the chiller tracks, but I wanted it to be layered and so deeply focused on like having all these melodies. Yeah, no, I specifically that one stuck out to me when it came on. I was like, "Ooh, this one's a little different," mm -hmm. and it had yeah that little arpeggiated yeah. motif thing. Mm -hmm. maybe, 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 maybe we maybe we give it a little a quick little run. Okay. Could we, could we, which track is this one? So the last one? The last, last one. Track. Yeah, I did like these these chords. Just felt a little like happier. And the bass line is more deep house. Bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. It's that, not like it doesn't roll like tack out the woof, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of tension here like there's like a little uh snap. i love these parts where it's just it lets your brain breathe yeah and that's no where kick. you flow into dream state well we listen to the first track and the last track <laughs> I like it. That's okay. Normally those are like the most intentional in some way. Like You're you are not get people in. Yes or no. So it's the beginning of your dream and the end of your dream. You know, you... you. This track, this is the oldest one in the album, I think. I wrote this really, really long time ago. It went through hundreds of renditions before it became what it is now. But what I like about it the most is like, it's an ode to my sleepless nights. Um, it's an ode to my insomnia, like too close. I always thought he's, you know, people think he's singing about a, a partner or somebody. Ah, too close, get away from me. But no, he, it's he's talking about sleep. My sleep is so close, and I can almost taste sleep, but it's too far. That's the worst. Yeah, that and feeling is sad. No sleep, too close. You know. Yeah. And that's kind of where that idea for this track came from. And I wanted, it, I didn't want you to feel like you have to move. I felt like you were just flowing in the song. That's why I create a lot of tension with the melodies and, and the risers yeah. and stuff. And then those are different arms playing with each other, you know? Is it's like one a, of those tracks, though, that you are, you know, it's about 3 a.m. in the club, closing your eyes a little bit, and you're kind of feeling the vibes. That's what this feels like to yeah. me. Like a little yeah. more lovey, yeah. yeah. Like a little, more like happy. A little kiss on the forehead. Yeah, yeah, kiss on the forehead. I yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. That's perfect. Very nice. This song hits the G-sharp spot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah. No, you got to make a t shirt out of that. I thing. think so. It's, I've said it three times now. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I have to get it approved by women first. To make sure it doesn't like affect yeah, yeah, yeah. Do a little survey. I don't want to get killed. Well, it is. Instagram it does include poll. music. It does. So it's a little less intense. It just depends on how you do the t shirt. Yeah, because it's like a sexual innuendo, right? But everyone knows about that sexual innuendo, but you're using it as a key, like a G sharp, you know? Anyways, we're not going to unpack no, this no, or feel, get too I far, <laughs> but I have to cut All this All right, one. back to the different <laughs> rights, we think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, let's... <laughs> I got an idea. Uh, you went to Burning Man not that long ago. Mm, that was my third year this year. I saw that you said it was your Phoenix year. It was. Definitely was my Phoenix year. I'm assuming you want me to talk about that. I mean, you can talk about that. I, I There's a few things going on with Burning Man. First of all, it's just like... A lot. It's mm -hmm. like the festival of festivals. It's like hard mode, you know. No, it's not even a festival. It's what you bring. All the attendees make it what it is. So it it's it's a really crazy place. It's anybody asks me, should I go? It really depends if you're ready to go. Are you ready to survive? 
right? You're living in a desert and you bring everything in, you're taking everything out with you. Are you ready to be completely amazed and re-inspired by people's creativity in a way that you've never known was possible in humanity and it's, you know, in its social settings? And it's just, it's, man, I, I don't even know. Like there's so many, like insert all the positive adjectives I could insert about <laughs> Burning Man and then insert all the difficult adjectives. Like that's what Burning Man is. You know, it's very hard. It's not all fun and games. I'd say probably like most of it is not fun and games. But the most moments that you have these like very like crazy stories and you hear it from all burners that I don't know, they jumped in a pool full of rubber duckies and found like a, a golden ticket on the bottom that led them to the other side of the camp where somebody gave them a ride on a hot air balloon and landed them on a pyramid. Like that's so normal at Burning Man. And anyone that's but went to Burning Man knows what I'm talking about. But then you say to the real world, to the default world as we call it. And people are like, you're nuts, man. That sounds wild. Like, what the hell's wrong with you? You know? That concept. Sorry. No, you're good. I was going to ask you what your craziest rabbit hole was, but go for it because that'll lead to another rabbit hole. <laughs> we could, uh, I, I liked something you touched on, which is like the, the normal world, the default world, mm -hmm. um, which is just that a lot of people that go to like raves and stuff, they have like a totally normal life outside of it. Yeah. But this is a place of, you know release and i don't know really what the question is fully it's just like do you feel like that's healthy to have like that separation like because i i feel like it has to be separate because the you normal mean, people would be like what the f what are you guys doing out there like you know but it is also popular a lot of people do it i mean eighty thousand people for 30 something years have been going to burning man so that goes to show and and it's not like Everyone goes. I mean, yeah, everyone could potentially find a way to go, but a lot of the people that are going, you'll see, are very much people in my business, people that are very successful in the line of work that they're in, and that's a place to escape this reality, right? This reality, in a sense, um, in a very interesting way. What Burning Man does is it cracks that little shell that you think you're hidden under, and now you've become this very vulnerable chick that <laughs> walks through the desert, you know what I mean? And and it hardens you and it toughens you and it also softens you at the same time and it eases you to show you that like life can be amazing and super creative but it's also not all fun and games it's not just party all the time um, yeah and birdie man has separation of all it really is it's a build your own adventure like no one ever comes back doing the same thing i've never gone there for three years and come back with the same story it's always different and a lot of that is based on what the people bring in you know, it's not the desert that's creating these experiences. It's the people that are creating them. And you go to raves and you have that four, six to eight hours where you're, you know, letting loose. You're listening to music. You're sweating. You're dancing. You're meeting people. You're talking. Burning Man is that times 50. You're living with the people that are throwing the rave. You know, you are uh, meeting all of them. You're all villages that are taking care of each other. There's no money, but there's a barter system. People say that it's the kindest place on earth, and I agree. People's intentions are kind. No one's really nice. Burners are known to be sarcastic assholes. You know what I mean? And that's because it's like a fuck your burn. Take care of yourself. You know, um, it's not meant to be like offensive. It's meant to be like, we're all here. We all made it here, but you have to rely on yourself and the things that you do have to rely, you know, you have to do your own thing. You have to be self sufficient. Self sufficient, but self inclusion. Right, so you radically self-included into what's happening. You see a piece of trash on the floor, you pick it up. You see a bunch of people marching the lambada, you're jumping in. You know what's the lambada? You don't know what a lambada is? What is that? A Chandler? Just Come on. because <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a place. Oh my god! Is that like? I, I mean, I can't put my finger on it. It's 100%. a type. It's a type of song. Lambada, the song itself. I forget the name of the group, but it's very old, 1980s. And the lambada itself is a dance where everybody's walking like the, the Congo line kind of. Oh, like everyone's got their hands on each other's shoulders. Yeah, but kind of different. Everyone's dancing more to the lambada. Dude, look it up. It's really All right, we'll look it up. Someone <laughs> fucking... What? You don't know the lambada? That's crazy. No. It's too against me. How did I... Okay. I don't know. We're going to have to look it up. Yeah, look it up. Point. So everyone's doing a lambada and you're jumping in, right? That's Burning Man. And it's not uncommon to see a lambada while, while your kitchen's on fire. You know what I mean? It's totally... It's Burning Man. Then there's another thing I love a lot, which really sticks with me. Burning Man, Safety Third. 
Mm. What's first and second? Whatever you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not safety, let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, some of the videos I've seen. Oh, no, no, no. I was like, there is a lot of like, you know what? We'll do it that later. We're going to go do something else now. Yeah. You know? And it's really important to have a good group of yes. people to be there with. Not to rely on, but people that you're going to build that adventure with. I'm sure it's also like, you got to be self sufficient but also like i'll help you out if you're like fucking dying yeah i'm not gonna leave my friend out in the desert without water but i'm gonna like tie that water bottle to a fishing line and make him come and get it you know what i mean <laughs> that's burning man like it, it's it's people are sarcastically asshole but very kind they will help you in a heartbeat but they'll make fun of you along the way you know or they'll say some comment to you along the way and i love that because it's it's authentic it's almost real like hey dumbass way to forget your water good job but then boom they bring you a whole jug of water gallon of water to have for the rest of the week mm. i think that's a good thing because you know it's like euro ravers and american ravers always have this like in america everyone's so friendly plur is a thing and in europe it's kind of like don't fuck around you know mind your p's and q's but also you know we'll help somebody and i feel like that might be like the happy median between mm. the both of them of like you know i'll help you and i'll be a little plur but also, fuck you for yeah. making me stop having to take my shot over here. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And and to touch on the Euro and American, like, Americans will say, excuse me, when they push you sometimes. I mean, we've all experienced the people that don't. In Europe, it's you don't say excuse me, you just excuse or pardon me now, or you, like, walk right in and they understand. There's an understanding that we're getting through, you know? And I feel like Europe, from at least what I've experienced, is, like, it's just more spread out depending on the festival i mean spread out too but i think the the purpose of people's intentions is different like in europe when they go out they are going out like it's the last night if they have five euros in their pocket they're spending that five euros on drinks if they have their friends they're buying their friend they're literally it's that this is the night that we are going out we're going all out i love that yeah and it, i wish i could tap it's into that it more. gets crazy really quick it, it does they get slosh wasted really like, fast you know i was in the uk well the uk whoa, is whoa, whoa, whoa. the uk is a different machine like the try, alcohol goes crazy over there <laughs> i was like i could never keep up i think i would have died three times trying to keep up with some of those kids so try to go to like ukraine or like poland where they they do the same they drink to oblivion but they can hold their liquor really hard uh, but again it's like they go out it's like this is my night to go out i don't know what's tomorrow i don't know what yesterday but i know i've worked hard and i have this money and i'm going to spend it here with my friends so the the mentality is like very much let loose whereas in america we're a little bit um spoiled you can go to a party and you can go to another party and you can go to another party tomorrow and you can be at another party till 11 a.m and then you can find another place to go to and then it, it always options to, to go to another event or another party especially and, in the city especially yeah. in the city big cities you know cities where where community is thriving there's always options to go to a lot of things and it kind of you're not really going like okay I, I don't like this place i'm gonna leave that's fine in europe like i don't like this place but you're gonna wait and it becomes the place to be you know they make it that whereas if it's not something you like immediate there's not that immediate grab onto oh, I'm having a good time, you're going to go to the next spot. And it's not going to cost you much money to get there. And it's probably, you know, more than half the time you can get in for free or you you buy a cheap ticket at the door, whatever. You know a guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's, and then a lot of it is also like about being seen, right? Yeah. yeah like yeah. Uh, this, this phone culture, which I'm noticing too. Like I watched a video of, um, of Kyanic music and they went on and, everybody was on their phone it's, like yeah. hundred millions of phones and nobody was dancing and it was good music and i think that is becoming kind of part of european culture but it's very prominently american right i mean it's so bad though and i and i you know i was watching like a john summit video or something where he was playing madison square garden and every phone like you could watch the show just through the sea of phones and it's like you know when i was a young a young raver I once was taking a video of Feed Me and this guy took my phone out of my hands. I was like, what, what are you doing? And he's like, watch what's in front of you. Yeah. Don't live through the screen. And ever since then, I do not take videos. I'll do it here and there, but I'm like, oh, I want to be in the moment. That's what I want to remember, right. you know? Right. Old school raver approached you and was just like, put that shit down. He like literally <laughs> looked me in my eyes and was like, put it down. I was like, yeah, okay, and, okay. And that was the thing. Like, no one cared to see your videos you posted of your show you were just at. 
And you're no, not going to no look at them again, cares. really. Dude, I have this concept. This is actually stolen kind of from my brother. And this is already kind of a thing. But like, if they just told you when you walked in, hey, we're filming this with like 8K cameras and like the audio quality is going to be perfect afterwards, you don't have to film anything. We're filming it. They yeah. still would, though. Yeah, of course, no, because it's right. their memory. It's the, it's on their phone. Yeah. It's very much me, 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 me. It's my, like, my, my, like my, the my, flex. Yeah, 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 but... Yeah, yeah. So as much as I love the new age of technology and phones and I don't want to talk shit because it's given artists like me a platform to step out without maybe having that chance somewhere else, right? I love where technology is going, but I also think it's so important to have health with that, like understanding like, hey, stop using your phone to videotape everything and vlogging and you're at a show and you didn't even, you don't even know what songs they're playing because you're just too busy up here doing the phone, you know? And learning to enjoy the moment i think it's something that is becoming less mm -hmm. of a thing and, and i think shazam is okay if you are shazamming in the crowd <laughs> shazam you is okay. are allowed Speaking, you can hold your shazam button and it will auto catch and you can put it in your pocket and all the entire playlist will get captured by your shazam you don't need it in your that's hands. amazing oh, i did not wow. know that yeah Pro just tip didn't realize press that. and hold and put it in your phone your microphone will catch it the you know time. nobody needs to be on their phone no. yeah yeah it's no, all going no through how of my friends know on instagram that i went to a show you know what i mean so it's like how will they know where I'm at at all yeah. times? It's, well, that's the culture. It's the culture of like, look at me. I'm doing this cool thing. I'm backstage. And backstage is just a bunch of people who are tired half the time. I'm like, mm. it's not like, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. You know? Yeah. It's cool to see it from the other point of view. But, you know, if you're in front of the sound booth, that's where it sounds the best. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't, I, I don't just blame the consumer. I blame the artist, too. It's become so much about us being on camera because we need to put this content to show the agents that we're playing shows in front of this many people. And so, you know, it's yeah. creating this, oh, I need content. Oh, I need the content. I need, you know, and instead of like, like we're DJs, right? We're servants. I'm in the service business at the end of the day. I am serving the dance floor. I'm serving the people that came to dance. My job is to make you dance or create an atmosphere. That I'm a servant at the end of the day, right? To the people that are paid money to come see me play or have a ticket to the show or whatever it is my role in that on the lineup is. And so... You know, it's a disservice often when I'm just making that show about um, all about me or, you know, it's it needs to be this perfect thing. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of it because I need to capture content where I am individualizing my experience, but it needs to be together. You need to enjoy the DJ. The DJ needs to feed off your energy and everyone is together. But the DJ is always yeah. serving the people. I have a, I was talking about this with a friend and I went to a show recently and I was like, you know, Keep sinking, listening thinking in this couch yeah it's a sinker it yeah. kind of is <laughs> i want to sit in that side over there <laughs> yeah honestly if there was a way to flip the cushion because a lot of people sit right there okay so there's a lot of butts that have been nice that spot. but a lot of b2b here huh <laughs> yes sir but uh i was talking about this with a friend that like a lot of djs i like don't know a lot of the music now because there's so much music you know what i mean obviously there's the tracks that everyone knows that are the tracks of the summer or the tracks of whatever the time is right but uh, back in the day i knew a lot of songs that were played and i'm questioning if it's that i'm not as tapped in or is it just that there's more and also does it do i have to go to a show and know the music to mm -hmm. have a good time because i like those moments where i can sing along know each beat and like fucking tap my fingers to it and like do that but yeah i don't know i was having like a an existential moment in the club the other day i think it's a mix of all of it so like yeah there is a lot more producers because production is far more accessible than what it used to be 10 years ago back then good luck trying to like buy programs and having all those Learn. capabilities yeah, yeah. Now it's like you got a YouTube channel and and you have uh, splice. you can splice or you can crack a program and you can do it all for free and write music, you know. And a lot of us did start that way. Like I don't know if I should admit this, but when I started out with a, a FL Studio in the beginning phases of my career, is like I'm 14, 15 years old. I cracked the thing. Bring in the cops. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I cracked the I could didn't I couldn't afford buying it back then. I was like a teenager in in high school, and so I would crack it and I would just learn, 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 learn. And I would use the music that I had available to me back then. We would download it from LimeWire, you know. And oh yeah. Nowadays, it's like, oh, here's a song, Shazam, Spotify, Apple Music. Within five seconds, you know the song. Where you know, and and that's creating this like, okay, 
abundancy abundancy so more songs are getting made it's easier than ever now to be independent you don't need to be signed to a label um and i don't think labels like that because now you can be an independent artist that releases music on anything without the label backing right and with enough money connections and, and other things you can promote this to be get like on a, on a nice playlist so it's made it more accessible you're seeing more music but now it's causing another thing like i don't know about you but i'm hearing like the like the beat for top 10. Mm. it's kind of the same thing over and over and so you're hearing the same music just written in a different equation or the equation numbers are the same just put together in a different way on uh, and it can cause fatigue we you you live long enough listening to this genre you eventually want something more you want something different right there's a reason people will start with trance and then somehow end up in dubstep or or you know drum and bass or they'll end up listening to more deep house our our palettes change but it's not staying in one place so you're noticing yourself listening to new music that is part of it for sure you know and you're not connecting to the same songs that you used to listen to and they don't move you like uh, like production wise the same the songs that i released three years ago i don't connect to as much now but back at the time that i wrote it that's what i was listening to that's what is inspiring my sound you know do you feel that way ever like the way that i was describing it do you do you have a similar sense like obviously you know i dj sometimes i'm not like constantly looking for new tracks for a set um so obviously being a dj an active dj will help you know invigorate what's out there to know what to yeah. play and whatnot but do you do you get that feeling sometimes, sometimes sometimes but i do my diligence to make sure that i'm up to speed on what's coming out right yeah. so like i do a lot of labels will send me music or I'll get promos, you know, through InFlight and I will sit and listen through each one and I give it reviews because I like when people sit, listen and give me my reviews when my shit gets sent through promos. So I'll sit there and I get current things that are about to come out, which gives me an eight month lookout. Like, for example, like um, was it was a Don Dalla track. I can't remember the name of it, but I got it a month before it came out and then it came out and then six months later, that was the top track on Beatport. Right, so I already had it. I already knew that it was going to be a track. I already had it in my playlist that I was playing before other artists had it in playlists, you know? So it keeps me current. And I think remaining current, staying current is super important for DJs. Producers, it continues your inspiration, but you have to be current um, with what's happening because then you end up losing, like you lose time, right? Time kind of goes further away and you're, you miss a sense of like what songs would have hit. Yeah yeah and i i feel like something you said before though about the homogeny of it that it's like oh it's just kind of the same track mm -hmm. recoded in a way that it it almost makes me feel like i don't it's, really have to keep up with it's like oh uh deep dubstep's in right now okay i kind of cool. know what yeah. the everyone's gonna sound like that's a little too blank blanket statement -y. i don't want to you know sure and of that's, course that's generalizing is, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. only thing we can do in this sense but i think it's almost yeah, it's almost about knowing like what uh, is hot right now, and you you do want to know what's hot, but I, I don't allow that to like influence me. Yeah, yeah. Like I I don't I don't think I've ever played a set where I downloaded the Beatport Top Ten and that's what I'm playing that night ever. Because why the fuck would you hire me to do that when you can do that on Spotify? You <laughs> exactly. know what I mean? Yeah. My job is to curate. I need to have something you haven't heard of, but enough for you to be hooked. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that, as a DJ, like, I, my job is to create the atmosphere. And also, while I'm in your ear for that hour and a half, two hours set that I'm playing, create a connection with you where you can be like, oh, I really like this DJ. I felt like he played for me. Or, oh, I really like this vibe that this room has. It's a party, you know? And when people ask me, like, what's your genre? I'm dance music. If you're dancing, that's what I'm playing. I like dance music, you know? And it's important to, to stay current, but also stay unique. S shine out of the hundred other DJs that are, or could have been on that slot and would have played the same top 10 Beatport tracks, you know? Have your weapons, but then fit them in with new tracks and, you know, different things that make your sets interesting. I think it's very, 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 very important as a, you know, a, on the basis of you as a DJ. For sure. I'm like worried about this justice show. Don't worry, man. It's, I already got six phone calls. Seven fifty-five. But, but we can we can wrap. We can start wrapping up. Sure. I got a couple. Take your time. I'm not rushing you. Okay. I'm Ukrainian, anyways. 
the justice does, does, staring you in the eyes right now. Does a uh, Ukrainian mean that you are late to things, or does uh, is that what you're insinuating? No, no, it's a joke. When you're running to the bathroom, you're Russian. Oh. When you're in the bathroom, you're a European. And then when you're done, you're from Finland. You're Finnish. Love that. <laughs> you got all the dad jokes just ready yeah, to yeah. go. <laughs> I have a lot. I have not heard that, though. Ask my friends. I, like I have a lot. I love metaphors, I love and I love dad jokes. Well, I'm here for it. Um, G Sharp. G-sharp it's kind of dad jokey. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get so much p- problems for that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no. I can't believe he said it. Let's see. I'm just making sure that we... There's other stuff we could go over, but it would be way too much of like a a sidestep. Mm. Um, although Side, more sidestep than a, the beginning of the yeah, heading right. comes. <laughs> well, and then the veterinarian thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we go on tangents for nice. sure. It really um, impacted my life today. <laughs> I saw that you can you can hold a hand. This is where I'm just going to go and do it. You can hold go. a handstand for a minute. I Longest I held a I'm handstand was three and a half <laughs> minutes. Maybe four. Damn, you got some strong wrist, shoulder, fucking. It's mostly the core. shoulder girdle. It's the curve. Well, Are you a yoga guy? No, I'm not. I was a martial artist for a very oh, long time. Taekwondo. Yes, black I, second degree black belt in Taekwondo. So second degree means you're even cooler than just a normal black. <laughs> it just means I broke two bricks instead of one. It's still I'm cool. gullible. <laughs> no, it, I believe you. That was my test, but uh, it, it's. Uh, I trained for a long time. Like I didn't just. Bam, became a black belt. I think between the age of, I don't know, seven, I did started karate and I always loved it. My father was a boxer in Ukraine. He's actually the European boxing champion of Ukraine in 1983 and 1984. And I, so very serious boxer. Yeah. So it kind of ran in my family sports. And I never found myself very good at like football, American football. You know, I could run, say, play soccer, but football, like I just wasn't good with team sports. I don't know. I always liked to do things on my own. I was good at swimming. I was good at martial arts. Uh, water polo, I was exceptionally good at, but that's because I had to swim by myself, and my martial arts skills definitely Dude, it's in. hard. Those are two yeah, very different sport. experiences there, water polo and karate. Yeah, yes and no, right? Because there is that sense of sportsmanship, which you, you get from martial arts, but you're also like literally beating the shit out of each other in the water. So true, true. Okay, yeah, now that you point that out, yeah, you, it does make like, sense. They would always like, oh, we used to hate it. They used to kick our in, in the knees or whatever and leave it. Like, like very, under the water. Yeah, so, like no one so then you would, the whole team would start a fight and you dunk the person and you got six people <laughs> oh. dunking you on there. You Those know? are and, deep pools too. Yeah, yeah, like 14 feet pools for sure. So I, I did a little bit of water polo. Didn't last long. Got kicked out for fighting actually. <laughs> but uh yeah, martial arts, taekwondo, Master Greer was, you know, the, my master, I guess. He trained me, and um, well, that's where I got my black belt with him. And I honestly thought I would open my own martial arts school, but I think I had other plans. Dude, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, and it's, it's unfortunate, but you're an interesting character, and that's, that's a good thing. So, But I guess I am just curious, because like people that know martial arts and like know how to kick people's asses, and you just have that in your back pocket, that's your weapon? As you were talking about, like your your DJ weapons, uh, like yeah, um, I, I don't even. Does that just give you a sense of calmness? No, it doesn't. It makes me far more analytical of a situation. For example, I'll come into a restaurant and I will always sit with my face my face facing the door because I want to know what's coming in. Right mm. when I am walking with my wife, I always make sure I keep her on the inside of the street. It's just things that I've learned to defend myself. I look at it this way: like I never go out looking for problems ever in fact if if you know anybody that knows me i'm i dismantle things i'm very peaceful but there's never a time where i will back off of a situation that i feel like i can handle right because i'm trained for that i've trained long enough for it i've been in a situation where i felt unsafe and so i make sure not to get there but if i need to i will you know and when i was younger yeah i was more impulsive and you can you know find me with my friends and they, they would use that a lot they would be like oh yeah come step outside with me and then they would call me outside with them and i do something and everyone no longer wants <laughs> to throw them yeah well i was really good at like double jump kick that i would do or i could like f- you know flip and back kick and kick a water bottle off your head and that was like our party trick back in the day um and long time since i've ever physically been engaged in like either the sport you know or outside of it I believe personally that everyone should know how to defend themselves, but the number one thing that my master, my trainer taught me was the best fighter is the one that knows how to walk away with a handshake without even starting the fight. That's true. You That's know? Real. 
Yeah, I feel like I hear that among people that are in martial arts. At least, like, it seems like the yeah. smart ones are like the well, best because, thing. Because to do you is know not. what road it leads to. You've seen the damage that it can cause. You live around, you know, seeing that and and mitigating it. The whole point of martial arts is not to attack. I mean, I hope you can, but the goal is to always making sure that you are avoiding it. But in, it, if it is inevitable, you are able to utilize the space, the the surrounding, and the the skills that you have to quickly end it. Like mm -hmm. most martial arts will teach you, you don't grapple for 35 minutes in a cage. It's just not realistic. It ends in five seconds. Uh, strike happens and then there's a reaction. You either get hit, you defend and you strike, you know? And so I'm not gonna get into the, yeah, 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 the yeah. whole theory of martial arts, but the goal is always to be quick and to avoid it if possible, you know? Yeah, I just, uh, the reason I asked, I saw it and I was like, that's interesting. I'll ask him about it. I will it, but... say, mm -hmm. Doing martial arts, like the big influence, it taught me discipline. It taught me to self-start. Every morning I, I get up and I know that I need to do this. And that's what it taught me this like, you know, focus and 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 coordination, perseverance, all these beautiful words, insert adjectives here, you know, but it taught me discipline, which was something that is not taught in school, in my opinion. Like, yeah, you can have your classes at nine, but people are a little gentle martial arts kind of like almost like military you, you have this agenda this is what you're doing and there's a, a etiquette to it and that taught me discipline the rest of my life moving forward mm. so like i'll wake up early and i know what i'm doing and i know that i'm doing it and if i'm not doing it no one is doing it for me and that's the discipline of it you know yeah i feel that i i wish i w i think if i have a kid i would put them in some kind of martial art for that reason also i'm i'm very peaceful as well never been in a fight in my life like nice. a real that's amazing like not a, a lot of people fight. can say that i'm very disarming mostly it's somehow i was raised in a way where like i was like how do i not get fucked with that just disarm situations mm -hmm. and yeah i just but i also question this is just me that it's like i wish i knew how i wish i knew how to protect myself a little bit more like i think like yeah i could Ah, uh, yeah. But that's pride. Yeah. <laughs> that's pride in us. But I also just don't. Well, I will never want to get into a fight. I, I don't know if women think this way. And I know some women that do and some that don't. But I can only speak from the male perspective is that men, we have this ego. <laughs> men are just like, <clears throat> yeah, well, we're like, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna fuck you up. Uh, and, and all of a sudden you're trying to prove something. And that's not martial arts anymore. Mm -hmm. That's not the arts of, you know, doing this like learning to be disarming with your voice that's martial arts learning to uh mitigate as little damage as possible and avoiding a situation confrontation or conflict before it occurs that's martial arts when you're doing this whole puff in the chest or don't talk to me that way or don't look at me like you know like this uh very i get what you're saying that's like, yeah, just... like this ego part and that part is going to always fail you in a, an emergency situation it will always put be against you in in a sense where you need to use the arts you know yeah that makes total sense that it, one thing is trained so then you're aware well, or, you, or you know what to do in the situation you said it you talk to martial artists most of us do not look for fights we don't seek fights we don't want to fight there's no reason to but trust me when I say that if there is one, we will know how to. <laughs> I'll fuck you up. Yeah. We'll All right. So just so people know, <laughs> Alex Kislov, don't fuck with him. We'll just put it that way. That that's what I wanted to talk about. No, very nice. Come come give me a hug. I love hugs. <laughs> but don't fuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll bull constrict. No, that's more like jujitsu shit. I anyway. think I'd be more of, like you can fuck with me, but don't fuck with my wife. Like I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. No, I'm I'm with you in the sense that like this is why I wish I could fight is because like when people fuck with my family and people I care about, yeah, I, it, I, it throws me off. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Back to peaceful. If Back to <laughs> Sorry. Peace. No, 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 no. Reel it in. I just, I'm in. looking through my questions, saw that worth bringing up. Um, I'm so happy we didn't really talk about the Chicago music scene because I feel like it gets dicey and I just, I'm glad that we talked about spiders and bats and <laughs> a dream. the real all things those people random yeah, yeah, yeah. veterinarians yeah Borat. But, but you might have to come back <laughs> you might have to come back for a Chicago music scene breakdown at some you point. know I uh, yes I I will I would love to first of all this is a great conversation the atmosphere in here is amazing and I'm very much enjoying this conversation me too yeah I think when it comes to one thing Chicago industry it's 
all about how you take it, right? If you make it personal, you're going to get offended a lot. If you make it business, you're going to get fatigue from, mm, mm, you know, people mm. telling you what they can do and then you don't, or some people wanting things and they don't. And not everybody works together well. We're also Chicago. This is Al Capone City, man. Somebody's pockets are always getting filled with something. You know, there's so, a gangster mentality. It is really, and gangsters work together. There's a reason they're gangs, but they also work against each other, and they don't like you in their territories, and, and it works that way, you know. And so, w one thing that I've been able to say is that I've kept a very clean nose. I don't really argue with people. I don't have beef with people. Some people might not like the fact that I'm Israeli, but I can't change that. That's who I am, you know, and. All I can say is you get to know me and I'm a vi I'm genuine. I'm not fake. I'm not inauthentic. And it often helps me, but it also hurts me because I do take things personal because I am personal, right? This is my life and I'm giving you part of it by, you know, working with you, whatever. Um, and so learning, distinguishing that is so important in this specific industry because I think LA and New York does a really good job at not making things personal. This is business. This is that, you know? In Chicago, we're not like that. Everything is yeah, no, it's one big jumble of feelings and emotions and and business. You know, that was a really yeah poignant way of describing it because I think that's spot on from what I've experienced at least. Yeah, it's emotionally charged scene. What can I? <laughs> well, I mean, Chicago, everyone knows each other, has been around each other since the you know OG rave days, or knew somebody who knew somebody or what it's like we're all connected and i think that's why we're, we're also, so emotional about for things. sure we're not a tourist city yeah we have tourism we are the center point of the states right new mm -hmm. york between all of them we're right Got there we have tourism but not enough to sustain our economy or market you know what i mean there's not enough tourists coming here going to spy bar or to parties so it is our community that is going out and keeping those venues afloat that's why we are so protective of it because we are the ones maintaining it, right? You go and you buy a ticket, you don't realize that you're feeding this machine of our industry together, you know? Um, and it's important to... I, I lost my train of thought specifically on that, but what I think what I was trying to say is like, in Chicago, it's very personal because we're not driven by additional tourism. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's not like there's yeah. all those extra venues. I mean, I think certain venues like Smart Bar is such a historic venue that I do see some people travel to, yeah, you know, sure. and now yeah. it's like we have Salt Shed or, you know, something like that. You know, you're not traveling on a state to go to the Aragon or something right. like that. But, Dude, what's up you know, <laughs> the Aragon? I'm an Aragon hater. No, Sorry. I am too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It sounds so bad in there. <laughs> I'm actually the exact it's beautiful. same. Way. I've been to more concerts at the Aragon yeah. probably than any other venue you i love and hate it i actually opened for nora and pure new year's eve there it's beautiful hey. it's a beautiful place but the sound is so bad and i'm sorry to you the know aragon what happens the aragon they also took a lot of the the good areas and made them vip and then yeah. it became like you know why money no oh, yeah oh definitely it comes it down to money and the moment you become hungry for money you slowly see this dip Oh, it starts getting yeah because we degrading. we are the VIP is not so fun anymore because yeah. everybody's doing it yeah and everyone's on their fucking phones there too. and and also that you know and I agree I think the things that you need but ruin things is money right like you need money you have it's not a secret that money runs the world you need money to get the venue to pay the artist to get this and the people are buying tickets to give more money to it's just money that's running it but the more you become hungry for this money or changing the experience. And not to say like you shouldn't have VIP, but if you're going to have VIP, really make it VIP and yeah. focus on the atmosphere, not the amenities, right? Like focus on making that a VIP section that somebody paid that money for and it's exclusive to that VIP and there is a gain other than the view. You know what I mean? It's like half the time people buying VIP are people like us where yeah. it's like, I just want to sit down and I want a bathroom. That's not gross. Right. That's it. That's I'm so simple to please. I don't care about anything else. I just need to sit down and I need to not have something yeah. scary. Like for sure. For sure. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, with that said, what's your favorite Chicago venue to play? Oh my god. Ooh, while you answer I mean, I have to say the mid was my favorite at some point. When well, the it, mid was crazy. It, when it was open, it was my favorite venue. Um, I think I love Prism. I know I know there's people that don't love it, but I do. I really like what they like they did with Nightlife. They were the first ones to really take the step to becoming more like musically orientated venues. 
when this whole boom of nightlife started. Um, the mid was classic. The mid was awesome. I loved the team there. Mike Lang was like a dear friend of mine, used to manage there, and Fi. And all of, it was our spot. That was our industry spot. You know. Yeah. I think. Man, it's hard to say. Like, I love, I love playing at Radius. You know, I did Lollapalooza at Radius, and that was, I ended up playing a five, four and a half hour set on. Damn, Lala. that's it could, Yeah, because Medusa came late and then didn't show up in time for this. Whatever, I'm not gonna get in the <laughs> details. But I ended up playing four and a half hours, and, and it was full the entire time. You know, uh, that's really cool. Obviously, you got Spy Bar. That's a classic, and it's just a musically orientated spot. It's nothing. There is no pizzazz there. It's not like a huge LED screen or, you it's know. It's to the point. Yeah, sure. it's to the point. But it's a basement where you go sweat and dance with your friends, you know. And all my friends work there. So I love that part of it, too. It's hard to say. There, we, we do have a lot of really good venues. You know, I like playing at Concord. I like playing at Radius. I like playing at Soundbar. I like playing at Spy Bar. I like playing at the Mid. I like. So you just like Chicago is what I'm hearing. Yes and no. That's <laughs> <laughs> so a Chicago guy. Okay, then on the contrary, where do you hate playing? Hmm. Ooh, and this is gonna hurt some feelings danger i hate playing danger. at venues that don't care about the sound yes i hate playing at venues where i walk in and it's literally redlining like the entire fucking mixer board is all the way up red and it sounds like shit and it hurts and it hurts and no one does anything about mm -hmm. it to fix it i, I don't like yeah. those it could be anywhere yeah. you know so as long as the sound's good what's the most important part the sound is me? so important and i feel like a lot of times they put that like third on the list which i'm yeah. like it should be it's always... fourth after safety uh, there you go and <laughs> the safety's never right either yeah but you know i mean when you go into a place that has a system that's just bumping oh yeah it's... like i love a place that cares Beautiful. about the sound i love a place that has a process like somebody's there to actually manage the sound and, yeah. and the lighting you know so those venues, you can tell the difference immediately. Like you you come in as an artist and you appreciate it. But, Definitely. you know, you can't have it all. I've played way more venues with shittier sound than I think I've played with nice venues with nice sound. And it's just part of the game. You know, you, you live and you learn. It's one, it's one of the things I had my technical writer now, like, must inform of sound system. Mm, like, they got to tell you what they got. Yeah. What's the stack? Yeah. I went to Podlache the other day. Never been there before. What that is was it? fun. Podlache, P O D L. Like, what did you call me? <laughs> yeah. Is that Polish? Is bro? it Podlache <laughs> yeah. or Podlache? I've heard Podlache. Because it's Polish. Podlache? Podlache? Oh, maybe maybe I'm just saying it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I said yeah, it yeah, to yeah, the yeah. owner. I don't know. You could be, I'm like, wait, am I saying it wrong? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Point being that it was like very minimal lighting, the sound was dope. Like, mm -hmm. I've been trying to go there venue. for a while. You, you yeah, really need good. good sound. Like it's the yeah. number one recipe is good sound, and after that, it's good lighting, whatever, or good bar or a good seating area. But the number one thing should be your sound. Mm -hmm. You know, you put a bunch of people in I a basement in the dark, and you have a sound system that's fantastic. Everyone yeah. will have a good time. You just describe my bar. <laughs> this is why i like partying out here yeah. come on no i love chicago i really do this is my city man like it created so many amazing artists like green velvet uh fallout boy john summon i mean i could keep going we've we've added so many to music and this is a music city and i don't know what it is in the water but it's producing um a lot of us you know like cruella i could keep going like amazing chicago people kind of like like uh, Sweden, you know, the Swedish House Mafia or, or the Netherlands, they're constantly producing EDM artists left and right, something in the water. So, and a lot of it is because of the uh, environment that we're bred in, right? There's competition here and you have to be really fucking good to be on top of it. And then there is this drive, you don't stop working. And then when it's winter, you start thinking of your next strategy for the summer and it's this continuous pace of driving and, and driving and never stopping the grind, you know? And that's why I love Chicago. There's a lot of gatekeeping happening here. There's a lot of be seen happening in Chicago. And, and I think the effects of that are coming from New York, LA. We're starting to adopt the model that they're having to run nightlife. And it doesn't necessarily work. Also, you know, some people like it, some people don't. It just depends on where you are in that. Before it used to be, you know everybody who's working behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. So you want to be involved. Now it's like, well, I saw X and X on, you know, I TikTok. saw Dylan Francis on the street and couldn't even say his name. <laughs> you know what I mean? You so, know. yeah, uh, I agree. And and unfortunately, yeah, like that is a bit of Chicago too, but it's, it's 
part of the game and it's what i'm realizing more and more like there is a game that's being played all the time and you're either in the game or you're not you know but i think mm. chicago is still a bunch of kids who just love their music yeah. and just want to hear it loud we know? still very much represent music oh, first, yeah. you and know? i think there's so much good you know events coming out of chicago and people that are so talented may it be behind the scenes or you know right in the dj booth and right. i think that's really cool you know mm -hmm. there's a lot we're a blessed city we are oh, a third sure. biggest city and on top of that we have in my opinion the most thriving house scene community that's happening on the on in this country right now i mean arc alone now is yeah. so phenomenal and has brought you know the after parties of arc are crazy mm -hmm. you know not just saying that i, I wouldn't know because i'm usually a burning man now but oh well uh, when you when you take a break from being too cool yeah <laughs> well i played i did the elro stage at arc and it was amazing it was the first second year of the festival and loved it like amazing amazing festival but that's not the only thing that should get credit in my opinion oh no 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 i'm just saying now i feel like we're seeing more festivals that mm -hmm. are very centered around you know different types of not just house music but yeah, techno Riot Fest. and you know things like that but like you know chicago will always be the house and techno city from the iconic venues to iconic djs and you know what i mean now you can go on the water side and find techno being played by somebody or something like that yeah. so mm-hmm Arc can't take shout all the credit, effect. but I do shout out like effects always. But I do think that arc is a really cool thing, pushing more um, different types of house yeah. music, more tech, more breakcore, right? More, you know, even hardcore now. I'm hearing out there, which is well, pretty cool. the team behind it, like John Curley, who's the talent buyer for Oris, and and you got Garrett, uh, who goes by Infinity, and that team has always wanted to be that niche of house techno Chicago, and they did it after years of working with them. I don't know since the React days, they've niched it and they did yeah. it with extremely good backings and it sounds like the festival is very successful people love it they're really feeling good about it yeah. uh, so it redefined the levels of festival quality here as well so in that sense it's amazing right and then we've always had Lollapalooza, which has been massive in Perry chicago stage yep <laughs> sure. i've never been actually to Lollapalooza. Oh, i played stage. all the after parties never been to the actual yeah too old now you know well then Those there's where some days. Days. and say what you will there's also north coast which has been around for years and they were always the intro for young people that was my first festival exactly ever. mine too the first festival i ever played with north yeah. coast i won the competition for silent disco and that's i amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah it was yeah, amazing festival. and so they gave the opportunity for the city to come on but they they introduced so many noobs to house music oh, yeah. and dance music edm as a whole you know um so you got to give it the credit for that because that is such a good introduction you there's know? so many Chicago festivals that have really pioneered different sounds, like what is popular, right. or you know, maybe like jam bands, yeah. to, you bring know, lyrical back, lemonade. And, <laughs> oh God! I Spring played, Eddie. I played that festival. Spring too. Awakening was fun. Yeah, it's, it was like what pre 2015 is when yep. it was really peak. I think I played 2014 and 2015. I played the the main stage. It was a good time. Fuck it yeah. really was. That's I don't. Yeah. You know what? I'm not a hater of Spring Awakening. No, me neither. I thought it was great. I thought I, it was really good. I concur. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm going to try to reel it back in because I was like, oh, I'm glad we didn't talk about Chicago. And then here we, we go talk talking about, 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 about a half an hour into that yeah, conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, I, you know, I always ask people before they go if there's any shout outs before just like mm. anyone who's helped you in your career could it's, just be your wife. You so many go people are, there is so many people and one dogs. thing. Dogs. Yes, definitely. I, mean, I can start and let me pull my rover app and I'll yeah, name yeah. every dog's name. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, for me, I um, I realized more, there is a really good phrase, uh, alone you'll go fast, together you'll go far. And you don't really understand that until you have come to a point where you can't manage it all. And without my team behind me, or without the people that are every day, like, like when I want to quit, they're like, nope, you're not fucking quitting and kicking the ass. Or when I'm feeling down, they're like, okay, bro, I, I respect that you're feeling down, but Mm, come on you gotta you know you got content to put out you got a, a, a thing that you've given your whole life to it's these reminders it's these people um that i immediately come to my head that i'm so grateful for and it's so important to have a, a network a system to fall on a people that will push you to lean on you know um and that list consists of like obviously my wife who puts up with my craziness every day day in and day out you know and elizabeth um i think blake who's one of my best friends and Blake always believes in me just this like a like a golden retriever he's just always positive about this brand and he's always like dude I listen to this it's so good it's just you know making me feel 
positive about what I'm doing. That's really important. I got Marcus, who's filmed every single one of my music videos. When I'm feeling down, Marcus is always like, dude, you just released a whole album. Like, come on, you know? And it's normal to feel down, too. It's doubt. You're constantly doubting your art. Um, and, you know, so Marcus is one of them. And there's Oscar, who did the designs. M M Mavolha, who did the album art. I mean, I can keep going. I don't want to. <laughs> but really, like, I'm thankful to my, my team, my friends, my family for not letting me quit, not letting me back away, not letting the, not stopping and believing in my what I'm doing in the brand, even when sometimes I do feel like that. So I'm very, very grateful for that. I like that. that long, long, long window. No, I like the saying that you said. That was nice. <laughs> no, but you know your team, and that's important as an artist. Like, you care about every single person that put this, you know, idea into work, and that's so important, and I think yeah. that's really cool. They found it interesting enough to give them time out of their lifetime to help me put this out, right? Because I could never in my life put this project out without the team. And that is amazing. I'm so blessed to have people that will give me their time to put this product out, you know, and I'm, I never underestimate what it means to give your time to something. Definitely. Hell yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> more about the Chicago. Well, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm mostly just nervous about justice. I want you to get probably, there. I probably already missed group. it. No, 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 no. We got to get you out of here. Um, all right, guys. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming through. I've really appreciated it. Thank this you. Has been a, uh, we've gone a lot of places. Sometimes oh, yeah. I say that. You went all over my sequences, man. <laughs> we went fucking everywhere. We and I wanted to talk more about Burning Man. I felt like you had a good question, but no, we no. can't. We, we can't could go, go into for it. Days and we days. We keep going. Good. That's why. That, yeah, that's a sign of a good time. Yes, it is. Know? Yes, it is. Beautiful very, thing. very producers. <laughs> Let's get it, dude. Uh -huh. Yeehaw. All right, guys. Well, if you made it this far, we appreciate you, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Of course. Peace. Buy vinyl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buy merch. Yep. No. I wish I had merch right now, but I don't. All right. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. yeah. When but you come out of it, it's like... Out switching of out of it, you're like, can I hear? <laughs> oh, that was Where good. Where am I? Thank Beautiful you, dude. Thing. Dude. That was good. You that guys like it? One.